I want to begin uh, with a question this morning, and the question is this. Can I trust God and His plan? Can I trust God and His plan? I think for many of us, maybe most of us, we might say that when things are going well in life, when, when everything is, is going the way we like or, or things have come together, things are, are good in our life, it can be very easy to say that we're trusting God or that we're trusting His plan. But one thing is something that we all have to wrestle with is that when things are not going the way that I would see fit or the way that I would like or when there's adversity or problems or challenges or things in my life, we have to wrestle with this question. Maybe, maybe this morning you find yourself wrestling with this question, can I trust God and his plan. You know, we're in the book of Ephesians this week, and as you know, Paul was writing to a church in Ephesus, it was a church that experienced a lot of adversity, right? A lot of persecution, satanic false worship. We talked about how they were in the middle of a very, very secular culture, right, that was extremely counter to the gospel and to Christianity. Paul himself is writing from where? Anybody know? Prison. All right, Paul is in prison. He is in jail. And he is there only because he's been faithful, listen, faithful to God's call in his life. Right? He's in prison because of his proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he had been obedient to God, he's in prison. We might step back and say, that, that doesn't seem fair or right. And so Paul wanted to write to the church that they would understand the riches that they had in Christ. That they, that they would grasp, as we talked about on Monday, the, the, the glorious power and goodness of the gospel and what it meant for their lives. And he, he wanted them... To, to know him. We talked about passion yesterday. And he wanted them to live with passion for Jesus. But he knew that, that they needed to understand that, that God has a plan. And that their lives were part of that plan. And so I want us to, to look at, at, at Ephesians chapter 1 verses 9 through 14 this morning. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. But as you're turning there, as we're thinking about this, maybe you'd say, I can really identify with that struggle because I've got some stuff going on in my life, right? I, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I would guess that many of you have some stuff going on in your life. And, and maybe it's something that's happened to you, an injustice that you've experienced. Maybe somebody has hurt you. Maybe it's a situation at home. It's a family situation. Maybe it's a school issue. Maybe it's a relationship issue. I don't know, but you say, there are some things that have happened to me that have made it hard for me to trust God. Or, or maybe it's not something that has happened to you. Maybe it's something you've done. Maybe you feel like it's failure or mistakes or shortcomings or poor choices and you'd say, I don't know if God's plan is still for me because I've really messed up in a lot of ways. Well, I want you to, to be encouraged by God's word this morning and I want us to look at this passage and think about, can I trust God's plan? We're going to begin uh, by looking at verses 9 through 11. So let's read them together. It says, God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ. A plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. And verse 10 says, And this is the plan, that at the right time he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. And furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Our, our word for the day is plan. And so we're going to think about this concept of plan. And, and, and Paul, as he's writing to the church, he says that God has now revealed to us this mysterious plan or this mystery regarding Christ. Now, when Paul uses the word mystery, right, he's talking about a previously unknown truth that now has been revealed. And so, and one of the things Paul's going to get to is that, that Jesus came for everyone. Right? Not just for the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles too. And you have to understand, if you were a Jewish person living in the first century AD, that was a hard concept to grasp. Right? In fact, a lot of them never did or never could grasp that Jesus had come not just for them, but for the Gentiles as well. And as he gets into chapter 2, he talks about how in Christ God is making one new people, made up of Jew and Gentile, that we all have access to God through Jesus Christ. 
And so he says, God has revealed this mysterious plan regarding Christ. And he says it's a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. God has a plan and a purpose. God has a plan and a purpose for his creation, for people. God has a plan and a purpose for you. And I want you to understand that this morning that understanding God's plan will help you to be able to trust God with the situations in your life. He says it's a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. He says here's the plan. At the right time he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. Right? The ultimate plan of God is a restoration of his creation and of people. Right? God made a perfect world. Right? But we rebelled against him. We sinned and we brought death and destruction and evil into the world through sin. Right? But God has a plan to restore that one day. All things created. New creation. Heaven and earth merged. Where the people of God, the redeemed people of God of all time will live with their God forever and ever. No more time. Right? We will be with him forever. That's the plan. And Paul wanted the church Right? And he would want you to understand and to see that plan. Why? Because we need to see our present circumstances and the stuff that we're going through and the adversity that we're facing and the struggles that we have to understand what God is allowing. We need to understand that in light of the great and glorious plan that God has. Right? It's one of the purposes of, of the book of Revelation. Right? Is, is to give us confidence that even when there's chaos in our life, and even when there's chaos in the world, and even when it looks like it's all falling apart, right, that God is on the throne, and He is working all things out according to His plan. But that's not always easy to trust, because God's plans, listen, will not always line up with what we think they should be. How many of you say, God's plans already in my life have not always been what I wanted? Anybody? Right? Have you noticed that? That the things that we want or things that we desire, or things that we have asked God to do and God hasn't answered that prayer the way we wanted? Or God seemingly hasn't rescued us out of a situation that we felt like we needed to be rescued out of and we wonder, God, what's your plan? What are you doing? Why haven't you acted? Right? And one of the things that we have to realize in life is that God's timetable and God's timing is very different than ours. Right? And God's never in a hurry. But he's never late. I think about David, right? King David, right? He was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be king when he was a teenager, right? Can you imagine if someone came today and anointed you to be king or queen? How many of you would say that would feel pretty good? Anyway, all right, a few of you, right? That was an amazing thing. And, and you might think, right, when God has sent the prophet Samuel and he's, a, he's anointed David to be the next king of Israel, but his life is going to be great now, right? How many of you say, man, his life's going to be great? Right? Well, what happens over the next several years? Right? Many of you know the story, right? David experienced incredible adversity and difficulty, right? He experienced, you know, being brought into Saul's house and Saul had a lot of issues, right? You know, we're not gonna, we don't have time today to get into all that, but let's just say Saul was a man with a lot of issues, all right? And Saul, the Bible said, would sometimes have a distressing spirit come upon him. And so David would play the harp for him. And when he played the harp for him, he'd feel better. But Dave, Saul got jealous of David because David was getting more popular than he was. And so sometimes Saul would throw a javelin at David while he was playing the harp, all right? Thankfully, David had good reflexes. You know, he'd be like, Whoosh, you know, you know. <laughs> And, and he was okay. But can you, imagine, like, can you imagine your pulse rate right there? You know? right? And then, of course, he, Saul hunts David. David has to live on the run. Right? Saul sends his army after David. And this goes on for years. He has to hide out in caves. And, 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 and his life you know, is, is, is very much very difficult. Right? Just because God's plan for your life is good does not mean that he will not allow adversity or difficulty, and we don't understand. But God was using all of that to prepare David to be king. And so God's plans will not always line up with what we think they should be or what we want. Listen, the Jews experienced that. Remember, when Jesus came, what did they want most? Right? They wanted political deliverance. Right? They wanted Rome to be overthrown. They, they wanted the, the temple to be restored to what it should be. They wanted freedom from the occupation of the Gentiles. Right? They, they wanted the kingdom to be there, 
now, visible, right? They wanted Jesus to take the throne then, right? They didn't understand that that would happen one day, but God had a different and much bigger and broader plan, but they couldn't, they struggled to accept that. And sometimes it's hard for us to, to wrap our hearts and our minds around what God is doing. But look back at verse 11 there. It says, furthermore, it says, because we are united with Christ. So he says, God's got this great big plan and it's going to happen. But he says, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. And of course, you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. We get into the subject of election and all those sort of things. I, I, I don't want us to miss the beauty of what God's trying to teach us through his word here by trying to figure it all out. But just know this, God is sovereign, he has a plan, and if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've placed your faith and trust in him, which is your responsibility to do, but if you have, you are part of God's plan, right? You are part of what he is doing. And he says, we've received an inheritance, right? God has a promise for you. He chose you, he knows you, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Now listen, not everything that happens is good, is it? Right? We know that not everything that happens in life, in our life and in this world is good. In fact, evil exists. Right? The Bible is very, very clear the fact that evil exists and that it's part of our experience and part of our world. And not everything that happens is according to God's will. Right? Everything, every day, things happen contrary to the will of God. Right? How many of you have ever disobeyed your parents? Wow. <laughs> it's like 100%. Mm. Do you think that was according to God's will or against God's will? Against. It was against God's will. So you're never going to do that again, right? <laughs> Don't make any promises. <laughs> right, but guess what? Your disobedience to your parents did not stop God's plan, did it? Right, see, God is sovereign. And even our disobedience and our evil and our rebellion never thwarts or stops God's plan. Not good things happen, but in God's sovereignty... Right? God works all things together for good to those who loved him and are called according to his purpose. And God is going to accomplish his purpose and his plan. And nothing can stop that. And that gives us hope and gives us confidence. Notice what Paul continues to write. Look at verse 12 through 14. God says, it says, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise to the glory, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, right, that's our response, our faith response. He says, when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. He says, if you've believed on Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. Right? He, he lives with you. He is God in you. And he says, he's given you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. He's identified you. He's marked you as his own. He says, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised that he purchased us, he redeemed us to be his own people. And he did this, why? So that we would praise and glorify him to the praise of his glory. Right? The, the end result of our salvation, of God's work in us, ultimately is that he would be glorified and that we would bring him glory. But that's tough. That's tough when we're going through difficult things. That's tough when we're in the valley. That's tough when we're facing adversity. That's tough when things have happened to us. That's tough when we've made mistakes and failures. But we need to remember this good news that God has chosen you. He's adopted you. He's marked you as his own. He's put his spirit in you and he loves you. Right? It's, it's an amazing thing. We're all invited into God's kingdom. Right? And it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, if you're black, if you're white, if you're poor. Listen, this, the gospel is even for people from North Jersey. I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean that's, that's stunning to me, you know. But God loves people from North Jersey. I don't, I don't know how he does it. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But I grew up in South Jersey, right? And there's a whole little south-north thing goes on in the state. But, you know, our divisions and our, the way we classify, they don't matter to God. Every single human being on this earth is made and shaped in the image of God. 
And I believe, as the Bible says, that God desires that every single one of those people would have an opportunity to hear and know about the God who loves them, and the God who gave His Son on the cross for them, that they might have an opportunity to believe and to know Jesus. Jesus died for everyone. He gives us His Spirit. And then look back at verse 10. All right, he says, this is the plan. At the right time, he'll bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth joined. Listen, that's our hope, right? And you, you, need, to, you need to see the big picture, right? Because I know from my own journey that sometimes when we're going through difficult things and, and when life is hard, it's sometimes easy to lose sight of the big picture. And I know, I believe with Paul, as he wrote to the church, he, he wanted them to understand, yes, you live in a difficult place, and yes, the Christian life is challenging to live out in this world. And yes, there's adversity. No, we don't always understand why God does what he does, when he does, and how he does it. But he says, I, I want you to understand this big plan. I want you to understand this glorious future, this perfection that God is giving to his people one day. And that's our hope. And he wanted them to grasp that. And the result would be that we would worship him, that we would, that we would praise him, that we would know him. Right? He, he ended verse 14 there saying, it's to the praise of his glory. Listen, if, if our theology doesn't lead to doxology, our theology is wrong. Right? And, and Paul wanted the church to understand that because he knew that Worshiping God and praising God is the purpose for which God saved us. And not only is it the right thing to do, and not only is it glorifying to God, but it's good for us. It's good for us. Did you know that worshiping God is good for you? How many of you, I don't know about you, but I, the last two uh, nights at sing time, I, I don't know about you, but I have been just so refreshed and encouraged. Last night, I just felt it was so powerful because there's something so beautiful and powerful about God's people worshiping Him and praising Him. And I believe He was honored and glorified. But it wasn't just for Him. Worship is for us too. It changes us and it transforms us. It reminds us of who God is. It, it helps us to lift our eyes up off of ourselves and our situation and to see God again for who He is, to be reminded of His character, of His nature, of His goodness, of His faithfulness, of His promises. and reminds us that we are saved to be worshipers of God. Right? And when you're going through stuff, whether it's stuff that's happened to you, whether it's a trial that you're going through, whether it's something that's been done to you or something that you've done yourself, you and I need to remember that, that worship is something that we need to continue to do. That even when we struggle to understand and even when we're questioning and even when we have questions for God, and it's okay to have questions for God, that we need to worship God. I love 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Right out of the Old Testament, Peter brings it right into the New Testament and, into, uh, and proclaims it over the people of God. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may what? Declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness and into His wonderful light. Think about it. You've been saved. He says, you are chosen. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Why? So that you can declare His praises and worship Him. You know, we live in a world where it's, it's hard sometimes to trust God. Right? It's hard. But we need to step back and see the beauty of God's plan. The beauty of His purposes for us. And to remember that if I can see that, Right, if I can see God's incredible plan that, that He chose me in Him, that He saved me, that He's given me His Holy Spirit, right, that, that God lives in me. And you know, that's a pretty extraordinary thought, isn't it? In fact, Jesus told His disciples before He went to the cross. He, he, he told them, He, he says, I'm, I'm leaving you. You know, in a little while, he says, you won't be able to see me. And they had spent three, over, a little over three years with Jesus, right? Can you imagine what it would have been like to be with Him day and night? Right? Traveling with Him, learning from Him, sharing meals with Him. He was, and it, it was, he was with them and they were, they, were, they were just in this amazing relationship and now it's going to change. But Jesus actually said, it's to your advantage that I'm leaving you. And I'm sure they thought, I don't think so, right? But Jesus wanted them to know that, that having God beside you was great, but having God in you was better. He says, if I go, he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he will be with you, he will be in you. And listen, where you are right now, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, 
Whatever circumstances God has allowed in your life, listen, He has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten you. He has not left you. He has not stopped loving you. He has not forgotten you. And He is with you. And He wants you to trust His plan. Paul wanted the church at Ephesus to trust God, to trust his plan. And so I don't know what it is, whether it's a family situation, a health struggle, a hurt that you've experienced. Maybe it's seeming like a prayer that you've been praying and God's not answering. But whatever it is, it's making you hard for you to trust God's plan. My prayer for you this morning is that, that, that God would bring your focus back to Jesus and that you'd see him and that you'd understand him. I, I, you know, one of the things that I often have to do is remember when I don't understand and when God seems distant or I can't figure it out, that I just need to look at the cross. Right? Because when I look at the cross, I remember that God loved me. Right? I go back to that simple truth. For God what? So loved the world. Put your name there. Right? For God so loved Dan that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Put your name there. Remember He loves you. Remember that He wants you to trust Him. And not just trust Him, but praise Him and to worship Him. Listen, whatever you're going through right now is not the end of the story. Whatever you're going through right now Whatever trial, whatever hardship, whatever thing that you're facing, it's not the end of the story. And it's not the end of your story. I want you to, to listen. Just listen to God's Word. You don't have to turn there, but it's Revelation 21. But I, I honestly, just, just listen to what John says. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And He will dwell with them and they will be His people. And God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Then he who is seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Listen, God is making all things new. And whatever you're facing, and whatever you're going through, it's not the end of the story. So what do you do right now? Because right, that's all well and good and we need to see that. But what do I do right now? Well, I need to trust Him and I need to praise Him. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you to really think about what's that thing? Maybe for you, it's one, what's that one thing that's making it hard for you to trust God's plan? Here's what I want you to I want you to write that down. You can do it now. Or maybe you just need to do it later today. Find some time to just have some quiet time and just to think about what's that one thing that's making it hard for me to trust God? And, and then... As you think about that, that one thing that you're struggling with, I, I want you to write it down. And, and then I want you to, to confess and pray to the Lord and say, God, I am struggling with this. And I'm struggling to trust you because of this. And I've been tempted to doubt your goodness or to doubt your love. And listen, God already knows it's so good to just tell Him. He can handle your heart. And He can handle what's there. Ask Him to help you. Ask Him to help you to trust His plan. Because He will. But I also want you to know that God doesn't want you to walk through it alone. And He wants you to, to tell somebody, to say, Hey, I'm struggling. I'm hurting. But you are in a safe place to tell people about your struggles and your hurts. Because none of us are perfect. And none of us have it all together. But you're in a safe place. Your counselors, you can come to me. You can come to your faculty. They love you. They care about you. Tell them you're struggling. Let them pray for you. Let them encourage you. Even when you don't. Understand. Psalm 62, verse 8 says, Trust Him at all times. O people, pour out your heart before Him, for God is a refuge. Maybe you just need to get alone today somewhere. Just pour out your heart to God and to let Him help you. Listen, trusting His plan isn't easy. Last night, uh, we sang a hymn that I had planned to, to talk a little bit about this morning. And uh, we sang some beautiful hymns last night. But one of them uh, was written by uh, a woman named Carolina uh, Sandel. 
And she was, uh, she was a daddy's girl growing up. And so I, I identify with her story because I have a, a daddy's girl. We, you know, our kids are the classic daddy's girl and mama's boy. You know, I, I got up this morning and made some coffee and was looking over my notes and got a shower and went back to the room and I noticed that my son had taken my spot, you know, in our, in our room. So curled up next to mama, you know, he, you know, cuddling there. But I have a daddy's girl and uh, we, uh, we love to hang out. We love to take selfies. So... Uh, and uh, she's my football partner. We like to go to football games. I think it was like 32 degrees that day, but she still went with me. You know, she, she just said, I'm, I'm coming. So I know what it's like to have a daddy's girl. But Carolina, um, she was a daddy's girl. She would play. Her dad was a pastor, and she would play in his office when he was growing up, and she was with him. But when she was 26, uh, her and her dad were crossing a lake in Sweden, and there was a storm, and a, a, a random wave hit the boat, and her dad fell over. And before they could assist him, he drowned. And it was very hard on her. She already had been given a gift of writing, poetry, and music, and songs. And, and, and she allowed the difficulty that she didn't understand to shape her trust in God. And she continued to praise Him. And she continued to worship Him. And so it was out of that experience that she penned those words that we sang last night. Day by day, and with each passing moment, Strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment. I have no cause for worry or for fear. For he whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. She said, every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. For all my cares he fain would bear and cheer me, he whose name is Counselor and Power. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. For as thy days thy strength shall be in measure, this the pledge he made to me. She said, so help me then in every tribulation, so to trust your promises, O Lord. You have to ask him for help. She said that I lose not face week's consolation offered me within his holy word. Help me then, help me Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take us from a father's hands, one by one, the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Would you bow your heads this morning? I want you to know that God can be trusted. And even in the valley, and even in the dark, remember that what you're going through is not the end of the story, and that he offers you grace. And he offers you help. How many of you just would say with, with heads bowed and no one looking around, just say, I I'm, I'm, I'm just want to admit that there, there's some struggle in my life. There's some stuff in my life and I'm hurting and I need God to touch me and I need him to help me. Would you just raise your hand so we can pray for you? So many of you. All right, I, I want to encourage you. Write it down. Take it to the Lord, but take it to somebody and let them pray with you and let them talk with you. You're not alone. Father in heaven, I thank you for your great love for us. And Father, I thank you that you demonstrated that love for us on the cross when you gave your son for us. But Father, as we walk through this journey, there are seasons and moments in life where we struggle to trust your plan. We struggle to understand. But Father, I pray that, that seeing your incredible plan, seeing your great purpose, seeing the future you've prepared for us, seeing the promises you've made to us, Father, may you give us the faith that we need to trust you. And Father, I pray for each person this morning who's hurting, who's going through stuff. Father, I pray that you would remind them right now that you love them, that you're with them. I pray that you would help them to just pour it out before you. And Father, I pray that you'd give them the courage to tell someone so that they can have someone come alongside of them and walk this valley with them. Father, I thank you that, that you love us so much. Father, work powerfully in our lives now for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.